Herzlich willkommen, meine Damen und Herren, im Namen der Wiener Volkshochschulen zu dieser Veranstaltung im Rahmen der Reihe Gegenbewegungen der Wirtschaft ihren Platz zuweisen. Die Reihe ist eine Kooperation zwischen WU Wien, TU Wien, der JKU Linz, dem Institut für angewandte Entwicklungspolitik, der Gesellschaft für Kulturpolitik, der VHS Linz und den Wiener Volkshochschulen, unterstützt von der Arbeiterkammer Wien und der Arbeiterkammer Oberösterreich. Die Veranstaltung heute Abend wird auf Englisch abgehalten. Sie können die Fragen aber natürlich auch gern auf Deutsch stellen. Sie werden dann übersetzt und durch die Moderation eingebracht. A very warm welcome from me on behalf of the Wiener Volkshochschulen. You are attending the webinar The Fair Work Foundation Strategies for Improving Platform Work in a Global Context, which is part of the lecture series Counter Movements, Putting the Economy in its Place, inspired by Karl Polanyi. My name is Stefan Jaksch and I will be responsible for the technical hosting of this online event. We are on the webinar platform of Zoom, which means you will not be able to turn on your camera or use your microphone during the event. Please share your comments and questions by using the F and A button. You can also ask your questions anonymously if you do not want your name to be mentioned. The chat will also be disabled during the event. I wish you and us all an exciting evening and a fruitful discussion. And I will now have, hand over the floor to Roman Seidel, who will facilitate the event tonight. Roman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stefan. Um, uh, also, a very warm welcome from my side. Uh, I will shortly introduce the, the speakers, and then we will start with uh, a lecture by Kelly. So Kelly Housen is uh, with the University of Oxford and she uh, has a background in development studies and also with value chains and uh, ethical certifications. And now she is with the Feuerwerk Foundation, which is not a surprise uh, concerning the title. And uh, um, here she's uh, looking at labor conditions, gig economy and so on. So we're, we're in Gig economy here, gig economy has maybe seen a surge in the last year. Maybe you have been using services of the gig economy within the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. So uh, she will, as far as I understood, she will also uh, go to that point, which will be pretty interesting to me at least. Um, and so we have seen some changes in the economy in within the last years, but Some of them may have been accelerated in the last year. And one of these uh, areas is the gig economy. Um, Benjamin, who will do, uh, Benjamin Herr, who will do the comment after the lecture. Uh, he's also uh, in the field of the gig economy. He's with the University of Vienna and the Austrian Academy of Sciences. He's a sociologist and he did, At least as far as I know, he has been doing studies in the in terms of labor relations, gig economy, digitalization, uh, and so on for yeah, quite some years already, and is pretty well known in this field for Vienna. Um, yes, so I will I will give the floor to you, Kelly. And uh, as uh, Stefan already said, if you have questions, just post them in the QA section of the Zoom webinar too. Thank you. Thank you, Roman and Stefan for the introduction and also for the very kind invitation to present a lecture today and to tell you a little bit more about the work of the Fair Work Project. Um, I hope to put it in the context of the lecture series, um, especially with regards to some of the uh, inspiration you're taking from Karl Polanyi. Um, just bear with me while I share my screen uh, and I hope that you can see the slides, not my presenter. Uh, it's the presenter screen. Again. Okay, let me just. But we already have, we, we're almost there, I think. Okay, I'm just going to. Um, I think the display settings helped last time. Display, oh, that's correct, screen. yes. Swap presenter view, there we go. Is that better? Yes, perfect. Okay, fantastic. 
so the first thing I wanted to say was just that this is a very collaborative project. Um, so I owe a lot of what I'm going to talk about to talented colleagues all over the world. And I especially wanted to mention my colleague, Srujana Carter, who I understand was initially invited to give this lecture. She's working very hard on, on her PH, a big PhD milestone at the moment. So um, I've stepped in on her behalf, um, but she helped me with some of the conceptualization and, and the planning. So I just wanted to acknowledge her. Um, in terms of my, my own role and my positionality, Roman, you already, um, you introduced some of my work, but I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Oxford Internet Institute. And as you mentioned, um, I have a background in development geography and economic geography. I have a particular research interest in South Africa and the la in labor uh, trends in South Africa. I'm currently based in Cape Town, although I'll be back in the UK next month. Um, I spent the last few months in Cape Town just as a, as a kind of strange, um, strange upshot of the COVID-19 pandemic, but uh, it, it really is a place where um, I'm quite interested in, in intellectual debates going on here. But the first thing that I wanted to do was to introduce the gig economy model in the way that we approach it at Fair Work. So just to give you some general notes on what characterizes the gig economy as we see it, it can be a slippery concept. Uh, Benjamin, as, as um, you know, uh, so it's difficult to pin down what exactly we're referring to when we're talking about the gig economy. It, of course, varies across work types, across jurisdictions, but it is characterized by certain com common factors. And the first of which is the centrality of the digital labor platform. Uh, some of the other common characteristics of the gig economy include that it tends to exist outside of what we would consider conventional employment relationships. Um, and some have argued that it is predicated on employment misclassification, but um, workers in the gig economy tend to be classified contractually as independent contractors as opposed to self as opposed to employees. It also tends to be characterized by piece rate work where workers are paid by task as opposed to by hour or uh, time period. Uh, so it, it tends to, um, the gig economy tends to involve short term and on demand tasks. Uh, as far as fair work is concerned, we divide the gig economy into two broad categories. The first constitutes geographically tethered work um, and by that we mean services that must be performed in a certain location. So this includes ride hailing, delivery, uh, domestic cleaning, care work and uh, beauty services. Uh, and the second category, category is cloud work. And this is work that can in theory be performed from anywhere with an internet connection. So work we commonly see in this category includes things like data processing, um, AI training, translation and transcription, as well as knowledge work, such as design uh, consulting, work that requires a higher level of qualification for entry. And in fact, the level of qualification tends to be the main kind of um, divider in the typology of cloud work. So a lot of cloud, uh, so, so uh, within the category of cloud work, we see two main uh, types. One is micro work, um, which is more the data processing um, uh, and AI training side of things. And the other is macro tasks, which tends to involve design and professional services. Micro tasks uh, take often less than a minute to complete, whereas macro tasks tend to, tend to be slightly longer term. Uh, in terms of, of some of the characteristics of the gig economy, um, especially those that have been criticized, a lot of them are not new. So things like precarious work is not new. 
even algorithmic management is not new. It has roots in, in Taylorism um, from the early 20th century. Peace rate payment is not new. Um, the overrepresentation of certain groups in more insecure and low wage work, such as people of color, uh, migrants, and women, none of this is new. Um, and even cross jurisdictional business process outsourcing is not uh, historically distinct to the gig economy. So think uh, call centers in the global south. There has always been a managerial trend or desire to control ever more minute aspects of the labor process, while at the same time externalizing costs as much as possible. But what I think is new is the scale, the efficiency and the immediacy, the ability to connect a worker with a client in real time and space. This is a product of recent technological developments. So mass connectivity, cheap technology, internet penetration into nearly all corners of the globe. So through these preconditions, we've seen this explosion of gigification of labor and some sectors are more predisposed to it than others, um, including the taxi industry and the delivery industry where, where tasks tend to be um, more immediately uh, uh, responsive to local demand and um, more short term. So like many things, um, the gig economy or gigification of labor has been accelerated by COVID, as, as you mentioned, Roman, especially in uh, the delivery sector and in cloud work or online remote working. All of these preconditions might lead us to think that the gig economy and its current conditions and organizational forms are the inevitable result of the passage of, of technological advancement. This is a narrative that certainly serves the interests of gig economy companies and is perpetuated by many of them. It allows them to argue for the merits of disruption, the disruption mentality or the move fast and break things mentality, which was famously expressed by Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, but the extension of this logic is that regulation needs to change to allow for the gig economy model or to accommodate uh, gig companies and that we should accept that this is simply how the future of work looks. Soon we might all be gig workers, and that's just progress. Um, however, technology is imagined, built and deployed by humans in response to specific social motivations and conditions. The gig economy is not determined by inevitable technological development but by how people with the power to do so construct and direct te technological tools. So that is simply to say other versions of the digital economy are possible, fairer versions and more equitable and democratic versions than uh, what we see today. But right now, um, as you may be aware, uh, there's a lot about the global gig economy that isn't very fair. Because the majority of gig workers are not classified as employees, in most jurisdictions, platforms don't need to ensure that they earn the minimum wage. Also because of their classification, gig workers tend to take on most, if not all the costs related to their work. So for a ride hailing driver, this can include car maintenance and fuel for other gig workers, um, insurance, tools of the trade, transport, and uh, mobile data. The nature of piece rate work means that earnings can also fluctuate substantially day to day. When demand is low, workers often need to work or to be logged in and available to accept jobs for long hours just to break even um, or just to take, uh, take some earnings home after covering costs. Most platforms don't consider this to be actually working time, but for delivery riders, this usually involves waiting outside restaurant hubs with your bike. Um, for a ride hail driver, it, it involves waiting in your car. And we hear a lot of stories about ride hail drivers um, sleeping in their cars, 
at hotspots waiting for a ride. Cloud workers also can spend a large amount of unpaid time searching and waiting for work. Um, a survey that we conducted recently of cloud work workers found that um, uh, it, globally, they spend an average of 16 hours a week uh, looking for jobs. So that's time that they're kind of contributing to platforms operations, but they're not being paid. For all of those reasons, gig workers are often in danger of falling below the minimum wage after costs and wait times are taken into account. They have a high level of unpredictability when it comes to earnings, as well as limited ability to negotiate their rates of pay. Platforms often can change the commissions that they take without warning. Alongside taking on all of the costs of their work, gig workers also often take on all of the risks. So platforms tend to exclude themselves from most forms of liability for negligence or poor working conditions in their contracts. Workers face immediate risks like road accidents, um, exhaustion, and liability for errors. Um, a recent Thomson Reuters investigation of the conditions of food delivery couriers in South Africa found that accidents and deaths were extremely common on the road. And I apologize, I'll, probably, I'll refer to South Africa um, anecdotally throughout the lecture just because it's the, it's the case that I'm the most familiar with. But here, um, one platform incentivized riders to drive in adverse weather conditions. Um, many of the riders did not actually have legal um, immigration status and so were unable to access even the small protections that were afforded. But it is very common for riders to organize uh, sort of mutual aid groups and to fun fundraise for, for instance, bodies to be repatriated to their home countries when drivers are, are inevitably um, and tragically killed on the road. But beyond the immediate health and safety at work concerns, which are significant, gig workers also face bigger existential risks. As independent contractors, they lack a social safety net and they are generally excluded from access to key protections like sick leave or parental leave, um, unemployment insurance or social security and protection from unfair dismissal. This especially was laid bare at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, when many gig workers lost their income overnight with uh, no security. And as a result, and this was as a result of lockdowns, those who were still able to work had no choice but to continue doing so, um, risking exposure to the virus, even if they were particularly at risk. The fact that gig workers can be arbitrarily terminated by platforms, often uh, on the basis of algorithmic decision-making, if, for example, their rating drops too low, uh, this drastically reduces their structural and bargaining power. <clears throat> Deactivated workers often have little recourse with platforms, which may or may not have a legal or managerial presence in their local area or in their jurisdiction. Algorithmic management systems can also serve to exacerbate existing social biases and inequalities. Um, and many gig workers face discrimination or harassment in the course of their work. Protected uh, and vulnerable groups are more overrepresented uh, over in gig work around the world. And this includes, as I mentioned, migrants and people of color. The gig economy is also highly segregated by gender with ride hailing and delivery dominated by men and domestic and care work dominated by women. While platforms assert that algorithmic management is more objective and less biased, the ability for customers to rate workers can disproportionately disadvantage certain groups who experience pre-existing biases. In cloud work, we have also found that workers from the global south reported much higher rates of discrimination from customers. For instance, with job offers excluding workers from certain countries, discrimination on the basis of geographic location is an element of unfairness that is especially brought into being by global cloud work platforms. 
which have been argued, um, including by my colleagues, to create a planetary labour market or, or a global labour market in which all workers are brought into competition with each other. Most gig workers also lack a physical shared workplace. They rarely have a relationship with an actual human line manager, but only with the app. Gig workers are much less likely to come into contact with each other over the course of their work. The nature of gig work is highly individualized and atomized. In the past, successful labor organization and resistance has depended on workers being able to connect and to build connections and solidarities through sharing their experiences with each other in shared spaces uh, that they occupy in the course of their work. This becomes harder due to the individualized nature of gig work, where workers are explicitly and deliberately positioned in competition with each other by platforms. Furthermore, um, again, mainly because of independent contractor classifications, workers often face higher legal barriers to organizing. For instance, in South Africa, the government has repeatedly declined to recognize gig workers' organizations because those workers are not employees, uh, to recognize those organizations as trade unions. Gig workers, so gig workers are generally seen as independent when it suits the interests of platforms. They are independently responsible for both the costs and the risks associated with their work. And they are pitted in individual competition with each other. But in other ways, they, they are extremely dependent on platforms. Platforms usually unilaterally determine the terms and conditions governing their work and set the rates of pay. Platforms allocate work algorithmically and institute complicated systems of incentives and penalties to manage how the work is carried out. Finally, platforms can dismiss workers without warning and without recourse, without the opportunity for recourse. So all of these conditions greatly constrain gig workers' structural and bargaining power. This delicate balance of control and, dependent, control and dependence on platforms, as well as legal independence, is enabled, I would argue, by the historically distinct geographical embeddedness of most digital labor platforms. We see digital labor platforms kind of strategically employing aspects of territorial embeddedness and disembeddedness um, to suit their interests. Many global digital labor platforms, and especially I'm talking about cloud work platforms here, think Amazon Mechanical Turk, Fiverr, Upwork. These platforms occupy a position of extra territoriality. The people who work on the platforms are embedded in local conditions in their local geographies. However, the labor that happens on the platforms can happen from anywhere in the world. Many types, many of the types of work intermediated by digital labor platforms can be theoretically performed from anywhere. And this casts workers into this planetary labor market in which platform policies, interactions, and rates of pay are uniform. However, we know that even on these platforms, these kind of uh, universal behemoth platforms, workers' experiences can differ significantly depending on their geographies and their local material real realities. A minimum rate of pay uh, is experienced very differently by workers in different countries with different purchasing power. As I already mentioned, workers can also experience place-based discrimination and exclusion from jobs on cloud work platforms. So these findings show, and this is, this is based on a, a big survey that we undertook with 800 cloud work workers in 70 different countries in uh, late 2020. Um, so this, this finding shows that place or local context still very much matters in the planetary labor market. And it highlights the need to find solutions to the extra jurisdictional nature of 
hard work platforms and the fact that they tend to evade local worker protections and regulations. So I think this is a really interesting um, thing to approach in terms of Polanyi's counter movements. We can see the, the interests of capital certainly working to disembed the labor from the um, local conditions in which it uh, originates. Um, and we advocate for counter movements to re-embed that labor in, in those conditions. You might also hear people referring to digital labor platforms as asset light businesses. Uber has argued that it is not in the taxi business. It is just a technology company. This argument is kind of assisted by the fact that Uber owns very few physical assets. It does not own the cars that it uses to operate. It does not employ the workers who drive those cars. It is not accountable to local labor regulations. And it sometimes doesn't even maintain a bricks and mortar presence in the cities it operates in. This ephemerality means that platforms like Uber can easily and cheaply withdraw from markets or they can plausibly threaten to do so. However, Uber is now profoundly woven into many aspects of our urban infrastructures and geographies. The same can be said of a lot of platforms, in, including food and last mile delivery. These platforms help to create and to recreate the urban environments that we experience every day. They are insinuated into our public transport systems and our economies. This allows them to wield extreme regulatory power, especially in lower income countries where part of their function is to fill institutional voids. Because they can exit so easily, but we are so dependent on them, they can hold lawmakers to ransom. It becomes harder and harder to regulate them to protect workers or address other local concerns. Indeed, this is why we've seen Uber successfully basically rewriting laws in some places to better facilitate their operations. So this might all sound very discouraging. Um, digital labor platforms operate in a regulatory void in most cases, which allows them to exploit workers and to rapidly scale up in order to cement and even to institutionalize their exploitative model. There is an urgent need for both national and global level policy dialogues and responses. Um, however, it's clear that there are serious obstacles to regulating the gig economy. Therefore, there's also a role for non-state mechanisms to play in shifting the conventions governing the global gig economy. And this is a core goal of the Fair Work Project. So Fair Work is an action research project. We are a coalition of mostly academic researchers who are focused on creating positive change through the research process. Fair Work's theory of change centers on engagement and advocacy with four main stakeholder groups. We consult and conduct research with and appeal to platforms, policymakers and governments, consumers and gig workers and worker organizations. Fair Work was spearheaded by my colleague, Mark Graham, who's professor of internet geography at the Oxford Internet Institute. Mark is still the director of Fair Work. Um, initially, the project was based on a partnership between the Oxford Internet Institute, the Faculty of Law at Oxford, um, the Institute of Information Technology in Bangalore, and the Universities of Manchester, as well as Cape Town and the Western Cape in South Africa. In the three years since it was established, Fair Work has now expanded into a collaborative network of researchers in more than 20 countries, uh, including Austria, I should mention. Um, because of what we understand about the global extraterritorial and ephemeral nature of platforms, the counter movement must also be global in nature. We have always aspired to grow Fair Work into a global network and we are continuing to bring on new collaborators. 
Most of our partners, as I said, are based in academic institutions, uh, but we also partner with independent research teams and with NGOs. Our network allows for a unique comparative perspective on the gig economy. And the, it's often really encouraging and wonderful to see the, the diversity of the expertise um, within the Fair Work Network. And I think that really lends strength to our action research and our collaboration. The core methodology of fair work research is based on these five principles of fairness in the gig economy. These principles were developed uh, through previous research, as well as through ongoing stakeholder consultation, including and, and most importantly with gig workers themselves in several countries. Uh, the principles continue to undergo, undergo a democratic uh, process of review every year. Uh, to ensure that they remain relevant and sensitive to current issues facing gig workers in the countries where we do research. Uh, so we evolve them and update them um, through an annual process. You can see here a general explanation for each principle, but they also include more detailed criteria, which can be found on the Fair Work website. But the five principles themselves are fairly straightforward. They're, uh, fundamentally that all gig workers should have the right to fair pay, fair conditions, fair contracts, fair management and fair representation. We've also adapted a version of the principles for cloud work um, based of course on the same key themes but acknowledging some of the main differences in between the geo-tethered uh, gig work such as ride hailing and the planetary labor market that's brought into being by cloud work platforms. Um, and the latter, we see specific issues there, including the potential for ge geographical discrimination, as well as a high prevalence of non-payment um, and a higher exposure, a higher risk of exposure to psychological harms. Uh, so the cloud work principles follow the same um, the, the same five tenets, but they deviate slightly in terms of the detail of the criteria. The, in both cases, the five principles have been further broken down into 10 thresholds. And our core fair work activity uh, involves assessing platforms against those thresholds to produce an annual score out of 10. To arrive at the score, we triangulate three main sources of information. So first, we, we access publicly available information about platforms and we review their policies affecting workers. Uh, we reach out, we then reach out to every platform we intend to score and we undertake sometimes multiple meetings and long threads of email correspondence with platform managers. Though some platforms inevitably choose not to engage with our research, we have built constructive, if sometimes a little adversarial relationships with a number of platforms in the countries where we undertake scoring. Platforms can provide us with more data about their policies and practices to help with the scoring process. Uh, however, I think it's just important to note here that inclusion in the league table is not voluntary for platforms. If they, if they fall within our scope, we will include them in the league table, irrespective of whether they choose to engage with the research. And I'll explain a bit more about what I mean by league table in the next couple of slides. Um, but this is an important way that we maintain the integrity of our methodology, as opposed to, for instance, uh, some voluntary ethical certification schemes that may fall prey to uh, corporate fair washing. Um, this also helps us to incentivize platforms to actively participate uh, because they're going to be scored and assessed Either way, it's almost always in their best interest to um, actively engage. And those platforms that do tend to, to perform better in our reports. 
Finally, we, uh, we undertake interviews with workers on each platform. And for cloud work, we, uh, we conducted surveys with approximately 60 workers per platform. These worker interviews are not intended to be a representative sample. And of course, because platforms very closely guard information about how many workers um, are enrolled, uh, it's impossible to generate a representative sample. But instead, we use the worker interviews to give us an insight into workers' experiences. And importantly, to test or to falsify the assertions of platform managers. So where platforms tell us about a policy or a practice, we seek to verify it with worker interviews. If worker interviews reveal that it is not always observed in practice, that gives us a pause in awarding a particular point. It's also important to note that we only award a point where we have positive evidence that it has been met. So if we don't have enough evidence, we don't award that point. And a zero score can indicate either that the platform was in you know, active contravention of the criteria of that principle, or that we simply didn't have enough evidence to show that they were meeting it. Every scorecard goes through a rigorous internal review process. So uh, it's reviewed by, by collaborators who, who are experienced in the scoring process from other teams within the Fair Work Network. Each principle contains a more basic and a more advanced threshold. I hope I'm not going into too much painful detail about the scoring process, but I think this is all useful context. So, for instance, principle one concerns fair pay. In order to receive the basic point, platforms must demonstrate that workers are paid at least their local minimum wage per hour after costs and waiting time is taken into account. In order to receive the advanced point, they must show that workers earn at least a local living wage after accounting for costs and waiting time. So in order to award the advanced point, we first need to verify that the basic point is being met. This provides platforms with an incentive to make changes to institute minimum standards of fairness. And it sometimes gives us a, a position of leverage where a platform might be potentially satisfying the advanced point um, in order to make small changes to fulfill the, um, the more technical criteria that is associated with the basic point. So this allows us to produce scorecards for each platform, which show the platform's performance against the 10 thresholds. Uh, these are hosted on the Fair Work website and they are published in annual country reports. The first global cloud work report um, will also be released actually on the 15th of June. And I've been leading the cloud work research, so I'm really excited to put it out into the world. Uh, we'll, um, I hope you don't mind a bit of a, a shameless self-promotion, but we're going to be hosting a webinar as part of the launch of those cloud work um, scores. So uh, I hope you'll keep an eye out if you're interested in joining and, and we'll post details on the Fair Work social media channels. But uh, another important part of our, of our methodology that I wanted to mention is that we also display each platform score on a, what we call a country league table, or in the case of Cloudwork, a global league table. The league tables are a really important part of the action research because they allow our stakeholders to very easily compare the performance of, plat of certain platforms against their key competitors. So, we hope that this will appeal both to consumers and, and deciding which platforms to use and also to workers and deciding which platforms to enroll with. Um, and platforms relative league table positions become a key point of leverage for us. So ahead of finalizing the scores, we advise platforms of their provisional league table position relative to their competitors. And we found that this is a very effective way to motivate them to make policy changes or to provide evidence in order to improve their position in the final published league table. 
The idea here is really to demonstrate in an accessible visual way the spread of practices that we see in the gig economy. Our league tables show that some platforms actually do take their responsibility to their workers more seriously than others. At a fundamental level, this shows that change is possible. Uh, better practice is possible. It also shows that unfair working conditions are a choice that some platforms are making. And by the same token, they can make fairer choices. So we've now reproduced this methodology for two years running in South Africa and India. We've also released league tables in Germany and Ecuador. Our UK and Chile reports are forthcoming. Um, and we have league tables in various stages of production in many other countries. And this building momentum is starting to add up to real impacts. We're increasing the profile of fair work around the world and building and our growing engagement with media puts further pressure on platforms to take us seriously. So with the help of some very talented colleagues, we've built our capacity to communicate and disseminate our work through various creative channels, including social media and popular media. We've produced videos and podcasts, and we're focused on finding ways to always make our work accessible to audiences outside academia. We've also contributed to some high-level policy discussions. Um, one example is a recent House of Lords inquiry in the UK into digital work, um, which we provided uh, oral evidence for the inquiry. And the report of the inquiry recommended as one of the key recommendations that the government strengthen gig worker protections. Um, we are especially focused on reaching out to and providing resources for gig workers. Uh, our online workers center includes union directories and other resources and tools such as apps that uh, people have developed that allow workers to more accurately measure their um, hours worked and, and challenge platforms uh, that might be getting away with non-payment. <clears throat> Um, we aim to provide a platform for workers' voices, and our podcasts produced by Robbie Warren have been one way we're achieving that. All of this helps to advance our core goal of shifting the underpinning conventions within the gig economy. We want the discourse to move from disruption rhetoric to something that actually acknowledges the human consequences of this disruption and the centrality of, of human workers to this process of disruption. Gig workers and their experiences have been seen as largely incidental within conversations going on in, in Silicon Valley in the past. But we hope that this is something that's starting to change. And we hope that we are playing a role, however small, in these developments. But beyond challenging the sustaining narratives of exploitative gig companies, we're also driving concrete material impacts in the countries we work in. So this tends to be based on a long and drawn out process of negotiation with platforms um, and on building relationships and building trust. Um, but platforms have actively made changes to their policies and practices as a result of engaging with fair work. While most have done this after a lot of diplomatic encouragement uh, in order to improve their relative league table position, more and more platforms are proactively seeking out our advice on how to improve their operations. Um, and as a result of the, um, the wealth of experience we're now starting to build across the different countries we operate in, we are more and more in a position to advise platforms on measures that they can implement to provide fairer, fairer conditions for their workers. We have found, um, perhaps not too surprisingly, that smaller, more locally embedded platforms are generally most receptive to these suggestions to change. 
for change as, a per, as opposed to the big global giants. And I can give you a sneak preview of some of the impacts of our cloud work research. Um, but I will just say that the league table in the report is embargoed, of course, until June 15th. Um, so I won't leave this on the screen for too long, but I hope that it, it piques your interest and please do follow, um, follow, with the, follow the release of the report. Um, so uh, the newest part of our, our theory of change, the newest methodology that, that we're incorporating into the Fair Work Network is what we're calling social transformation. And this is where we're reaching out to organizations and it could be um, academic institutions, local governments, um, as well as companies, uh, NGOs, and some religious organizations as well. And we're encouraging them to sign up to something we've called the Fair Work Pledge, which is, um, the, uh, by signing the Fair Work Pledge, an organization will be able to display the Fair Work Official Partner Badge that you can see on the screen here. Um, by making some meaningful changes to be supporting fairer work in the gig economy. So if it's a large academic institution, for instance, um, it might that might involve encouraging their students and their membership to be referring to the Fair Work League table when uh, choosing which platform, which ride hailing platform to use, for instance. Some organizations have built the Fair Work League table into their internal procurement policies in different ways to be encouraging the use of higher scoring platforms. So this is something that we're really turning our energy to now that we uh, have uh, league tables coming out in a number of different countries. Um, we are very grateful to, for the support of a number of different funders, um, especially the the German um, BMZ or the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development who has funded Fair Work through their implementation partner, GIZ. And I've just come in at under the 45 minute mark. So um, Roman, perhaps I should pass back onto you and we can invite some comment and questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly, for your most interesting uh, talk. Um, so now uh, I would again uh, ask you to pose your questions in the Q&A section of the Zoom uh, conference tool. And I would now ask uh, Benjamin for his comment on the lecture. Hey, everybody. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Kelly, for this um, fascinating talk. Um, I think it, it was not only an interesting introduction to the Fair Work Project, but also I think a great introduction to the gig economy um, in, in general. So um, what I found uh, particularly uh, interesting um, among many, many interesting things you you said was um, the epistemological quality of, of the Fair Work um, project. So um, specifically how it, how it uses um, social sciences um, to build on a more sustain, sustainable uh, vision of, of, of our economy. So um, what, what the platform economy um, shows is, is the desperate attempt of, of venture capital um, to generate profits in an environment of a stagnation falling rates of, of profit so um, leading to precarious work and I think you, you put this really well how, how work looks like for most works in the field company so low pay unsafe jobs discrimination um, and this being a systemic um, necessity of, 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 of these uh, business models rather than um, a feature that just needs to be adjusted. Um, so looking at the numbers, we see this um, um, that 
these avenues of, of profit production, um, they grow. So broadly spoken, more and more uh, members of, of the global surplus population uh, find opportunities to sell their labor power uh, in these or through this um, business model. And this massive development takes place on a global scale, which leads me to the first thing I, I like so much about the Fair Work um, project, uh, which is its transnational scope. So um, you, you showed us all those teams coming from different uh, parts of the world, uh, working together and connecting this variety of localities and um, research institutions. So uh, to uh, together evaluate um, set uh, work practices, um, and I think this is a this is a necessary necessary step to foster a transnational um, dialogue to map how capital and labor both uh, rework labor geographies, but also to build alliances um, towards uh, more sustainable uh, societal um, de development. And then. Um, I think that the, the Fair Work Project also fosters an emancipatory um, understanding of the social sciences. So um, it's, in, in my opinion, it's, it's, it's more than just writing uh, re reports and, and papers. So um, if, if I think uh, of the work we do in academia, it's about publishing articles and, and um, presenting papers at conferences and it's more about interpreting the world but it's it's not so much about intervening in this in this world and um, I think the people involved in the fair work project they they do they do intervene and they kind of take a step outside this uh, separate field and engage with the world and with working class realities so uh, social sciences here is, is more than, than an impact factor, but an instrument to grasp those um, recent and, and increasing um, developments um, in global capitalism. So this is uh, why I um, see the Fair Work Project, or this, this counter movements topic, this, this lecture is embedded into sort of reminded me as, as uh, the Fair Work Project being kind of a counter movement to, to um, mainstream academia. Um, so more than formulating an argument, more than identifying research gaps, and more than contributing to debates, and especially not being detached from uh, the living experiences um, of, of, of the working class. That kind of reminded me of, of, of the French uh, sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, who theorized on, on mainstream academia in his reflection of what he called scholar, uh, meaning that scholar being uh, this uh, social sphere, this social field liberated from, from necessities and where people are enabled to expand uh, on ideas and discursively engage uh, with the world. And having a more or less petit bourgeois uh, background, uh, but you're here critically uh, reflected on, on his precise position within society and uh, his social field and himself as a uh, progressive, um, progressive uh, intellectual. So putting this in context with the um, Fair Work Project, I believe that this, this project enables researchers to use the rule of, their, uh, of the specific social field they're engaged with, but also to step outside of it, meaning uh, to, uh, to be what would you call scholar, but also to improve working class realities and uh, working class emancipation. And um, coming from labor sociology, I personally believe 
that we urgently need this uh, sort of, of counter movement to, to social sciences. And um, so Fair Work actively uh, seeks a collaboration with stakeholders. And I think this, your talk um, showed this um, pr pretty well um, to, to actively uh, improve uh, working conditions uh, for labor. And I think uh, researchers should orient towards this kind of scientific uh, understanding. Mm, as the multiple um, crises in, in, in capitalism, capitalism uh, not only call, but, but kind of back us uh, to always keep an eye on, on stepping outside our scientific communities and to actually uh, contribute something but uh, written words and, and, and great ideas. And I think, yeah, Kelly showed, showed this, this pretty, pretty perfectly um, in, 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 in her talk and gave us a, a great example, um, not only about transnational um, collaboration, but also uh, how, how social sciences could contribute to um, a better future. So um, that's for me, thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. Um, Kelly, do you want to respond to the comment? Thanks so much for those thoughts, Benjamin. It's, it's always really interesting to hear your work uh, kind of interpreted and, and reflected back to you um, from somebody and, you know, who, who's well-versed in, in the kind of theoretical debates around uh, the work that we do. And I find your point about counter movements within academia to be particularly interesting. Um, we, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't claim that as a, a project we've kind of struggled to find our place within mainstream academia, because we are very privileged to be based out of an institution like the University of Oxford and to have the resources that that affords. But uh, we have found the need to continuously um, kind of justify uh, the work that we do as action research. Um, I think within the context of the, the neoliberal university, um, it is not always seen as the, the kind of work that we're supposed to be doing as academics in order to um, in order to kind of bolster our, our performance metrics and, and consolidate our place within the academy. Um, I hope that, I don't know whether anybody from the OAI is listening right now, and I should say that they've, they have been, as a department, really supportive of the work of the Fair Work Project. But um, it is true that I think that this kind of work is um, not always familiar within uh, social science circles and I, I certainly can't claim credit for the design of the project. I came on board after the project was conceived by Mark but I really really do appreciate working within um, a project that's oriented towards interventionalism and, and, um, and policy change and material impact to him to improve workers' experiences and to challenge the, the power that we spend so much of our time as academics tracing and dissecting and, and criticizing. I mean, in this project, we get to do both of those things, which is something that I'm, I'm very grateful to be part of. But um, by the same token, um, because of my previous work on criticizing um, uh, ethical initiatives and initiatives that are trying to make change in the real world. I think that we always need to be wary of the potential for co-optation and um, for corporate interests to undermine the, the kind of integrity of, of what we're trying to do. And I think that that happens all too easily, um, often without um, people, the people who are kind of inside that work being aware of it happening. Okay. 
Okay. So that was also what I was, was uh, going to ask, actually. The, the question is how other academics respond to that. Uh, because probably pretty different. Like Benjamin thought it was wonderful, but others maybe saying, okay, it's not, not what they're expecting from an academic institution or from an academic to do. Um, I wanted to pose another question more in the question of traditional uh, organizations. Uh, what is your relation to traditional labor units, uh, unions in, in, in this regard? So uh, are they cooperating? Are they suspicious of what you're doing here? Uh, can they relate to this kind of methodology? What is, what is the take on that? Um, it very much depends on the context, I would say, but our, our intention is never ever to take up space um, from work organization, including from traditional unions. What we aim to do is simply to amplify the work that workers are doing um, to organize within the gig economy. But we also know that traditional unions, um, for whatever reason in different places, um, are not always easily able to uh, represent the interests of gig workers. Like the example I gave in South Africa of um, there being important bureaucratic barriers to um, gig workers being recognized as, as members of unions. So we remain completely neutral in terms of the unions that we are supporting, but we have good relationships with a lot of unions in different places. Um, and we, one of our principles, I didn't go into too much detail about concerns fair representation, and in a couple of cases, we've been successful in, in, in um, convincing platforms to adopt a formal policy of recognizing a, a workers association um, if they were approached by one. Um, and so in this way, we try to support the work of local organizers without being biased towards any particular local organization. Okay, thank you. Uh, once again, uh, I'm asking you to pose your questions in the Zoom Q&A or F and R and A or something like that, probably in the German version it is called, uh, uh, and we will see them and we can then respond to them. Benjamin has raised his hand. Um, I, I had another question um, regarding consumers being a pathway uh, for, for change. So um, in, in your talk, you showed us this table and we saw Uber being more or less at, at the last position in, in, in the different um, national contexts. Uh, so Uber is, is the worst, but, but still it's, it's so popular. And there, there's this um, paper by uh, Andres Pekarek, I think, that deals with consumers and their attitudes toward gig work. Uh, so how, how do you see, what, what potential is there actually, mm. given that, that the labor is so cheap and reflects in, 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 in uh, low prices, yeah. Um, that's a, I think that's a really good question. And I have to say, um, my perspective on this might differ slightly from, from some of my colleagues, but, because of my research background, which was about, I wrote my PhD on the ability of fair trade certification to improve the conditions of laborers on South African wine farms. Um, and of course, initiatives like fair trade are very much predicated on um, the power of ethical consumers uh, to affect progressive change. And through that experience, um, I, I became very critical of this idea of, of the ethical consumer being able to correct the, the kind of injustices and inequities of the market. Um, for one thing, I think that it's a highly um, 
individualized and neoliberalized solution to collective problems and problems that are rooted in, um, uh, well, in the example of my PhD research and in, in, um, kind of colonial um, legacies. Um, and I also think that, or um, some of the research I've seen in this area suggests that uh, the potential of ethical consumerism has been quite overblown. In the end, consumers might claim that they make decisions based on personal ethics, but often when it gets to the point of purchase, uh, that doesn't factor in quite so much. And I think that we need structural collective solutions to what are structural and collective problems. Um, but of course, you know, Fair Work will continue to appeal to the users of apps to express in whatever way they can solidarity with the struggles of um, people who labor on or via those apps. But I think that our first port of call always needs to be regulators and platform management. And I think that those are the areas where we can have the most leverage and affect the most change. I hope that consumers will, um, will pay attention to our findings and I hope that they will um, kind of express solidarity with, with those workers. But and another thing that we need to acknowledge is that the consumers who have, and not all consumers have that kind of power, um, not, and that the consumers that do occupy a fairly privileged position to be able to make purchasing choices based on their personal ethics. Uh, I have one question, this is kind of related maybe, uh, is like when you look at the, the, the picture Benjamin pointed at, that Uber is always on the bottom, uh, is it always the same kind of platforms who are willing to kind of negotiate, collaborate, or even look at these kind of metrics, or is it different? Uh, so, so if you see a platform, can you already guess uh, if this platform is going to score all right, or if it's going to kind of even uh, collaborate with such an initiative or not, uh, then based on kind of where it's from or what is it or its rules or whatever? I do think I can now guess fairly well um, okay. after being got, after having gone through a few rounds of scoring, but I, I alluded to it a little bit in the presentation, but um, it tends to be the, the bigger platform, more transnational platforms um, have more resistance to change. Of course, there's a lot of kind of path dependency already built in a lot of inertia. They're not, they, they also are not as sensitive to bad press in one market. Um, so it tends to be the big platforms who are less willing to engage with our research um, and more reluctant to make changes to, to improve their score. So the platforms that have uh, been very receptive are generally the smaller platforms that might be focused on a local market or a regional market. Um, but with the what we have seen more recently is with big platforms like Uber, they've certainly come to the table. I mean, we we I think I can tell you we we have quite a, a frequent contact with Uber. Um, Uber glo globally and Uber, Uber's operations in different countries. Um, but as yet, I don't think Uber has made a change to their policies in order to score higher on the Fair Work League table. So um, I guess I would see that more as, as Uber kind of attempting to keep tabs on us than, um, you know, really engaging uh, constructively with the aims of the research mm, okay so it's, it's it's kind of linked to the culture of an organization maybe or of its position in the market okay and finally i have one question related to what you were aiming at that you said consumerism is not the answer maybe so it might be more like structural solutions 
And there is, uh, there's also a question I'm asking because I'm involved in that. There is uh, at the moment within the European Union uh, uh, ongoing debate on uh, changing the regulations in terms of platforms and uh, digital services and so on. Uh, is this anything where you can relate to or where you can say, okay, this might be something that is of any significance to, to this kind of initiatives or, or, or not? I, I can't, I don't know. What, so, what kind of structural uh, outcome would you like to see that, on the other hand? Yeah. Maybe if this is not an answer. No, I, um, we, we've seen um, in various jurisdictions quite recently, and I think uh, spurred on by the pandemic, we have seen uh, responsive legislation that has uh, tried to address the, the issue of worker exploitation in the gig economy, or also um, also uh, court decisions. So for, for instance, the Supreme Court decision in the UK recently that forced Uber to recognize its drivers as workers with certain employment entitlements and benefits. Um, and so that the consultation on the uh, European regulation of platform work happened at around the same time as the Supreme Court decision was handed down. And I think that there are some really promising movements um, at the level of regulation, both nationally and regionally, um, especially with regards to the employment misclassification of uh, gig workers. So the one thing that governments really can do to uh, extend uh, minimum protections to workers is to review or challenge their employment classification. The um, platform's classification of these workers as independent contractors or self-employed. Um, and I haven't caught up recently with, with the developments in the European Union, but I think that that was factoring into the consultation at least. Um, Uber released a white paper shortly after this consultation was announced that actually suggested this kind of third way where um, they were advocating for the establishment of another tier of worker classification that would essentially um, codify and institutionalize a lower level of employment protections for platform workers. And this is very similar to what they achieved in California with the ballot measure called Proposition 22, um, where, where they, they kind of succeeded in, in writing their own employment law, um, which was kind of a concession to some of the concerns of their critics, but mostly just allowed them to um, continue their um, current practices. So I think that it will be very interesting to see how this plays out in the EU. I, I mean, that was a bit of a rambling answer, but um, in short, yeah, I'm watching with interest. So there may be structural solutions, but there may be also kind of the opposite, like uh, you told about California, or even within the European Union, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, so okay, the debate. We have one question in the QA, finally. Uh, and the question is Do you engage next to the platforms as well with labor, national labor market regulators? So, do you engage with national market regulators? Or? So, by national labor market regulators, do you mean um, lawmakers or like watchdogs and. Um, kind of labor commissions and, and competition commissions. I'm not entirely sure, but- I, I'm also I not entirely sure, but I, I, I would suppose it's probably both. So this is kind uh, of all kind of formal regulation. In the national yeah. To answer your question on a general level, um, we engage wherever we think that we can have impact. Um, so we, we certainly try to um, advocate at a policy level with governments, uh, lawmakers and also um, any other kinds of inquiries or commissions that are 
investigating these issues. Um, it kind it, it, it's generally taken on a case by case basis, depending on the local team. Um, in mm. South Africa, our team here includes a few labor law experts. And so we've been able to produce a, quite a detailed policy document for um, improving regulation around gig work here in South Africa. Um, I see a follow up class. So, um, yeah, it is kind of an explanation of what was technically meant because uh, it's Switzerland. I don't know if you were engaged in Switzerland and that would be the, the political and federal state agencies, which are obviously doing uh, labor regulation. Mm. Do you any, know anything about Switzerland? Or? We don't actually currently have a, a fair work research team in Switzerland. Although, class, if you're interested, please feel free to reach out. We're always looking for new partners in different places. Um, but I mean, I guess the, the basic answer to your question is that we engage wherever we think that we can have impact. And so in the context of Switzerland, we certainly would be looking to engage with those bodies. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. Um, if there is no further questions, I would... Uh, ah, Benjamin uh, wants to say something again. All right. Sorry, I need to, to use this great opportunity to speak with someone on the Fair Work Project because I'm, I'm very interested in, in, this, in this thing about um, what you call ephemerality and extraterritoriality. And when I think about, again, the uh, four pathways, um, you showed us uh, how we can improve the platform economy for labor. So um, when it comes to extraterritoriality and ephemerality, uh, and then I think about collective action. I think, for instance, about Canada and Fudora leaving the market as soon as workers uh, uh, established a union. Um, wh what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, so this um, um, kind of strategic embeddedness and disembeddedness that platforms very consciously deploy um, it is a tactic to evade the consequences, both of regulation and of worker organization. Um, and there's no simple, you know, solution to it. There's no simple kind of counter movement. Uh, one, um, one interesting development that happened last year at the height of the, the first wave of the pandemic was this, wave of protests that spread across Latin America. And so these were coordinated protests um, amongst a number of Latin American countries targeting platforms in the food delivery sector um, in general. So, so this was, I think, the first real example we've seen of um, kind of transnational and um, uh, sectoral uh, resist, uh, a resistance movement. And um, I hope that we'll begin to see more of these. The UK Supreme Court decision has also been very influential, uh, I think, in other countries. And so I know that in South Africa, there are plans to bring a similar class action lawsuit against Uber here. Um, so these small victories in um, in isolated places actually encourage um, similar uh, resistance and activism in other places. Um, so there are opportunities for global solidarities um, and for kind of transnational worker action. Um, and I hope that, that we'll be able to build on those. Okay, thanks again. Uh, Benjamin, do you have another question? Or? I'm, I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> okay, no, I, I don't care, as you like. All right, uh, so if there is no further questions, I don't have any further questions. There are no further questions in the Q&A and Benjamin, even Benjamin has no further questions. Uh, I would like to again thank you for the excellent lecture and Benjamin for your comment and um, yeah, thank you very much and have a nice evening. Uh, thank you so much again from me for the opportunity. It was, it was fantastic to um, contribute to the lecture series.
and to meet all of you. Thank you very much also from my side and have a nice evening and um, come back to our lecture series next week on Tuesday, 6 p.m. There's the next um, uh, lecture with Julie Froud. So you find it all on vhs.at slash Gegenbewegungen. Thank you very much. <laughs>